after the Paleolithic period, after the Earth started to warm again after the last Great Ice Age, uh, this meant that there were significant changes in the populations of the areas that we have been studying, primarily Europe, because uh, all of these early cave paintings that we saw throughout France and throughout modern-day Spain, uh, the cultures that produced those disappeared. Uh, because they went away when the climate changed, when the food sources that they had been living on either migrated away or died off. And so this sort of flurry of art for, you know, 20,000 years or so that we, that we see during the late Ice Age, during the end of the Paleolithic period, stops in Europe. And so we have to shift our focus to the Middle East and to a place that we call Mesopotamia, which today is modern-day Iraq. We saw the effects, uh, a little bit of this, uh, in, the, in, in earlier, in, or in the last chapter, I should say, uh, with the rise of towns like Chat al Hayuk and uh, Jericho uh, here in Anatolia, modern-day Turkey, and also in the um, near Jerusalem, modern-day Jerusalem, um, but if we really want to see massive civilizations with large-scale cities, with huge populations in the tens of thousands, we have to move to the Middle East. And this area of Mesopotamia means between two rivers. The two rivers are the Tigris and the Euphrates River. And between these rivers grew up several civilizations. Uh, the sort of granddaddy of them all is a civilization we call Sumer. Now, I do want you to keep in mind that uh, we are going to be looking at uh, this civilization, Sumer, but around the same time, um, to the west, in Egypt, we were seeing the Egyptians grow uh, uh, pretty much simultaneously. So a lot of the, the inventions and the um, discoveries uh, of the Sumerians and the subsequent Mesopotamian um, uh, cultures also occurred in Egypt and there was a lot of influence between Mesopotamian and Egyptian cultures through warfare, through trade, and ju just through the fact that they're so proximal, that they're so close to each other. So keep that in mind. Um, but having said that, Sumer is significant. Um, Sumer was made up of a series of city-states that shared a common culture, common religious beliefs, a common language, uh, but were not united politically. And so these cultures were often at war with each other and in states of dispute. One of the thing that things that makes Sumer so important in, uh, historically is the fact that it is historical. It creates history and it does this through written language. Um, now, once again, the Egyptians, it's argued that the Egyptians started developing a written language around the same time as Sumer did. It's hard to say who was there first, um, but certainly if they're not the first, they are one of the first uh, to invent the written language. Uh, Sumer's written language began as a series of pictures, or what we call pictographs, or sometimes pictograms. And as you can see in this image, uh, the earliest words for certain, the earliest words were pictures of the things they were describing. So the word for a bull's head looked like a bull's head. A word for bull looked like a bull. But throughout time, these um, symbols became more abstract and represented sounds or the words themselves and, and didn't attempt to uh, be representations of the things they were depicting. Just like our modern day language, our word for dog does not look like a picture of a dog. We call this writing um, cuneiform, but this is significant because now we have writing. We, now we have intent. We understand what these ancient people did, uh, what they were trying to do, what they believed in, how their societies are, were set up, uh, all sorts of things. And we know this because they left behind lots of information, mostly in the form of clay tablets. Uh, these tablets were large slabs of clay that could be dried in the sun or heated up 
and they could preserve the information quite well. And we have thousands and thousands of clay tablets letting us know what the ancient Sumerians did and how they lived. And so we have important religious documents, but we also have things like epics, the first epic called the Epic of Gilgamesh, which I would highly recommend reading, um, was written at this time. The, the, so really the first story about a hero, the first story about a king, the first story about gods and monsters and trials and tribulations begin here, or at least were first written down here. But then there's also a lot of other things, things that are sort of maybe rather kind of boring, things like receipts, uh, shipping uh, information, taxation records, all those kinds of things have survived, but they give us uh, a lot of information about ancient Sumerian society. So the Sumerians were a religious society, and like all ancient cultures, religion is going to dominate the culture, it's going to dominate the arts, it's going to dominate the architecture. Uh, Sumerians were a polytheistic society, they worshipped multiple gods. Um, you know, they had gods for sort of major events, um, war, things like that, uh, but also natural cycles, sun and moon, weather events, and then other things pertaining to survival, goddesses of fertility, goddesses of, of, of growth and food, and, uh, you know, basically if it was a, an important um, part of human society, then there was a god representing that concept. Um, this was a very religious society. Uh, it is more or less a theocracy, a theocracy meaning that it is, it is a religious-based society. In the center of each town was a district that was dedicated to one of the gods. Each city had sort of its own um, sort of patron god or goddess, although they did worship multiple gods and goddesses, each city sort of had its own kind of home god. And that would be the subject of the main temple located in the middle of town. Um, these ancient Sumerians constructed these artificial mountains uh, that are known, uh, known as ziggurats. Uh, here's a reconstruction of a ziggurat. Um, these um, were, were quite large, they could be 40, 50 feet tall. Sitting on top of that would have been then a temple which would have been about the same height as the ziggurat. You are looking at what is known as the White Temple, known, I uh, call this because of its, of its white facing. Uh, that was located in the middle of, of one of the larger uh, of the Sumerian cities, a city called Uruk. The ziggurat was uh, accessed through a series of steep steps. Uh, it was constructed of mud brick, and the temple was constructed of stone. Uh, the temple would have been exclusive only to the priest, so your average person would not have been able to be allowed into the temple. These temples were literally called the waiting rooms of the gods. So it is thought in these temples the priest would communicate with the god or goddess who would then come down and depart divine information to, to the priest. Uh, the top of the temple would have been coated with basically what is asphalt, a material called bitumen. What you call me? No, I'm joking. Uh, a material called bitumen, um, which is the, the foundation of asphalt. If not bitumen, then another similar uh, material would have been used to help with er erosion. Um, the sides of the ziggurat were also sloped in a way to allow for water runoff uh, to keep from the wearing and tearing of the bricks. Um, in the center of the temple, there would have been things like a, a fire pit for offerings. There would have been an altar, A-L-T-A-R, for offerings, uh, where there would have been sacrifices made uh, to the gods or the goddess. So I, I, I want to stop here for a second and, and ask you guys a question as you're watching this. So why do you think that the ancient Sumerians went to so much trouble building artificial mountains to put their temples on? What does that have to do with worship? What does that have to do with deification? What does that have to do with a god or a goddess? Think about it. And if you're thinking because it brings them closer to the gods, you're absolutely right. 
something we're going to discover throughout this semester is that high places are holy places. And if you want to get closer to the gods, you have to ascend to them. And this is something we're going to see um, in religion after religion. Uh, we'll see this with the ancient Greeks and Mount Olympus. Um, in, in Japan, there's Mount Fuji, which is sort of the, the site of, or the, the origin place of a lot of the Shinto uh, spirits of Japanese uh, religious beliefs. Uh, even in Judaism and Christianity, you have Moses ascending Mount Sinai to get the holy word of God. So high places are holy places. But if you're in the middle of Mesopotamia, if you're near Uruk, let's say, in ancient Sumer, then there are no mountains. So you have to build one to get closer to the gods. And you place it right in the middle of town so this is, can be seen from miles and miles and miles away. This shows us also the importance, literally the centrality of uh, the importance of religion in ancient Sumer and that you put the most important things right in the middle of town and you put them up high where everybody can see them. Something else that is interesting is that buried beneath this the, the ziggurat at the a foundation, uh, what we call foundation deposits, are um, a leopard and a lion. Uh, we found the bones of these animals. Now, the reason for this is, is more than likely because these represent powerful creatures, powerful spirits. Um, you want to associate the power of the gods with a powerful animal. This is something we have seen all the way back to the Paleolithic period, which we just studied, with the use of bulls. Bulls are powerful animals. Uh, they represent masculine power. They represent fertility. They represent brute strength. Uh, and so uh, these kinds of powerful animals were important within the religious practices of Paleolithic people. And we're going to see a continuation of that. We're going to see an association of powerful, uh, often predatorial animals, but not always because bulls aren't necessarily predators, but we're going to see the association of, of strong, powerful animals with power with either religious power or kingly power, secular power, um, or both. And many times it's intertwined here in the ancient world. Secular power and, and religious power are kind of one and the same. So let's take a look inside of this temple and see the kind of things that we would would see. Now, um, this is called the White Temple. So the outside would have been painted this, washed this, this white color. Uh, it would have been highly visible. Uh, it would have set it apart from the surrounding architecture. Um, inside, you would have seen a continuation of that sort of whitewashed, serve those whitewashed surfaces, but you would have also seen what were called cone tiles. These are pieces of clay that have uh, came, came in different colors depending on the kinds of natural pigments uh, that were found in the clay or that could be added to the clay. So you could add different kinds of clay together or even metal pigments or in some cases even vegetable pigments and stain, and stain these tiles different colors. The tiles would have been polished so they would have had a sort of sheen to them. This is something we don't see in this picture because these um, cone tiles are uh, very, very old. But they would have been shaped like a cone, like an ice cream cone. And the walls of the building would have been made from soft clay, and so these cones could have been just shoved, pushed into the, the clay itself. Uh, they would, these decorative patterns, these, uh, this sort of highly polished surface would have set this interior off from uh, other architecture of the area. Once again, kind of signaling its significance. Because when you are in this temple, when you enter this temple, you are now in the realm of the gods. Uh, you have passed from one plane to another. Think of it this way. This holy mountain is something that you ascend. And as you walk up these stairs, as you walk up the stairs of the ziggurat, you are moving into the realm of the gods. And as you, as you take this journey, uh, you, are, you are moving from one plane of existence, the secular plane, into the sacred plane. And so all of these different kinds of 
strategies, these different sorts of special effects inherent in the architecture would have been used to delineate, to clearly define those separations. So as you walk up the stairs, as you ascend to the heavens, it is, it is meant, as you walk up the stairs, it is meant to sort of differentiate the two sort of realms, sacred and um, secular realms. And then the same thing would happen as you walk into the temple. And so the attempt here is to kind of dazzle you. These, this temple was large. It was you know, 30, 40 feet tall with these towering walls with light streaming in from the windows. You would have seen this large sacred altar. There would have been a large fire pit where sacrifices would have been made. And you can imagine sort of the dazzling effect of the light coming in from the windows and the uh, fire dancing in the fire pit uh, reflecting off of these cone tiles forming these patterns. Um, other things that we have found in these temples, um, this comes from another temple, not the temple, the White Temple at Uruk, uh, but a temple uh, at a place called Eshnuna. Uh, this is, these are votive, these are called votive figures. These were found buried under the floor of the temple, so these were meant to be placed there for a specific purpose, for a religious purpose. These figures vary from anywhere from a few inches tall to uh, over two feet tall. Um, they vary in size. The size of the figure relates to the importance of the person depicted. These are not just generic statues, but these were meant to depict real people, and we know this because their names are inscribed on the base of the statues. Thank you, Sumer, for inventing writing and making us our, our, our job easier as historians. So we now know what these represent. They represented real people. You can see that their hands are clasped. This is a symbol of prayer. It is very possible that some of these figures also were, are holding cups that were made as liquid offerings or what is known as a libation. Um, that's L-I-B-A-T-I-O-N, which is a liquid offering. And these um, figures are standing in this form of prayer. This is what is known as a votive figures. Votive figures are figures of, uh, are, are any sort of object of offering. You've probably heard of votive candles. Those are prayer candles. You meant, you're meant to light them um, like at a memorial service as a, as a sign of your memory or a prayer to that person. Um, or, you know, you can just light them on a, uh, if you're, you know, if you're familiar with Catholic traditions, you, you light a votive candle as a symbol of, of prayer. And so these serve a very similar purpose, except instead of being candles, they're figures in this state of sort of never-ending prayer, buried beneath the floor of the temple, standing in for the person who they represent, who can't be there the entire time praying, morning, noon, and night. So they would make this offering of this votive figure. You'll also notice they have massive eyes. Um, this is proof that uh, Japanese an anime existed thousand. No, that's not what it is. Um, what this means is that they are in the presence of the god uh, or goddess. Um, they have been spiritually awakened. Their eyes are literally open. Also, it probably means they are waiting vigilantly for the god or goddess to arrive. But it, it, it's meant to reflect the presence of the god or the goddess. You'll notice that the figures are distinctly male and female with the styles of dress uh, delineating the two sexes. The men, of course, have these beards, which are signs of, um, of, of, of wisdom. They have these braided, this braided hair, and they wear these sort of fringed skirts. And if you look throughout um, the image, you can see that is inherent in all depictions of men. Women wear this... Um, sort of dress that covers only, uh, leaves one shoulder bare uh, with sort of a, a, a drape over the left shoulder. So there is a distinction between male and female, but they are both here uh, sort of equally represented as devotees of this god uh, or goddess. Here we see another offering figure. The ones we just saw were standing. This is a seated figure, which is uncommon, but not unheard of. Uh, we see another female figure. We can tell by her, her, 
her clothing that it's very similar. You can see the traces of the left shoulder sort of drape here. Um, but we see once again those wide eyes sort of waiting in anticipation for the god or goddess. Um, this is called the Warka vase. This is a, a vase that was also found in, this was found in Inanna's complex at Uruk, where we saw the, the white temple in Ziggurat. Um, this is a, uh, then a sacred object once again. You'll see that it is divided into a series of distinct bands. We call these registers, and this is something very common in the ancient world. Uh, the register, R-E-G-I-S-T-E-R. -E the um, This shows us a series of offerings, and if you look on the left of the screen, you can see uh, a, a drawing where it's a little more clear. Um, but this is meant to show the ability of the goddess to provide. At the bottom, you see a, a, an image of um, of people, maybe slaves. Um, they are nude, so this means is meant to show that they are not important. They have been stripped bare of rank or title, uh, and they carry with them uh, offerings, food uh, primarily. But this is m meant to show not only their devotion to the goddess, but the fact that the goddess is able to provide for her people in such a way that they have this bounty to offer her. If you look at the very top register of the vase over here on the right or on the left, you can see an image of one of these um, supplicants, one of these people, serving Inanna, giving her um, this offering. You'll notice that she stands in front of a gateway. And behind the gateway uh, is an image, uh, are more images of offerings and bounty. Uh, this is meant to represent the separation between the secular and the sacred world. This is a portal, if you will, will an opening into this holy realm. So um, what we are seeing is, um, a, a, once again, a sort of delineation between the two different kinds of spaces. Um, you'll notice, let's... This is known as the stele of the vultures. A stele is, uh, S-T-E-L-E, -E, is simply a, a stone used to mark um, a place, um, often used as gravestones, uh, but they can also be used as monuments, memorials to battles, to monuments to kings. Um, they, they can serve a lot of different things, but they're usually large-scale stones that are, are used to mark something important, a person or a place or an event. Um, this is uh, a, a marking a, a victory of one city-state, a city called Lagash, over another city-state called Uma, and um, we are only looking at parts of one side of it. This was found in fragments. There's only seven fragments that exist today, uh, and we are, and the stone is not complete. The stele is not complete, and we are only looking at one side of it. So these are placed sort of roughly where they should be. Uh, it is known as the stele of the vultures because at the very top we see an image of vultures carrying off the the heads, uh, the body parts of the slain, arms, heads, legs uh, of the slain of those slain in battle, showing the power and the might of the victors over the vanquished. Uh, it's pretty brutal if you think about it. We see these dismembered bodies being picked uh, up off the ground by vultures. If you look to the left, we can see an image of the king, um, a, a ruler here leading his, his soldiers into battle uh, who are standing here in the phalanx uh, with their overlapping shields. Uh, underneath, we see the um, the king once again standing there, leading his people. I want you to see that. I want you to look at the size of the king, uh, especially down here at the bottom, compared to the rest of the the soldiers. And also, let's zip back here and take a look at 
some of our votive figures, you'll notice that they are significant. Some of the votive figures are significantly taller than some of the other votive figures. Just as you'll notice that the king is significantly taller than uh, the soldiers around him. Uh, this is the use of something called hieratic scale. That is spelled H-I-E-R-A-T-I-C. Hieratic scale. Here it is at the top of, of this list of, of terms here. Hieratic scale comes from the word hierarchy, and it basically means that if something is shown larger than anything else, that it is the most important. It is a, it is a symbol of power. It is a symbol of, of, of rule very often. Uh, certainly importance. So these, these figures here, this man and this woman, are more important than everybody else. This figure here is more important than everybody else. The ancient Sumerians buried their dead um, in relatively elaborate graves. Uh, we're not going to see the kinds of elaborate tombs that we'll see in ancient Egypt, uh, but certainly preparing for the afterlife was an important aspect of life in ancient Sumer. It is what we would call a funerary culture, uh, F-U-N-E-R-A-R-Y funerary culture, meaning that they placed great emphasis on the preparation uh, of the dead. Uh, because for the ancient Sumerians, as well as ancient Egyptians and other ancient cultures, death was just another phase of life. So you had to pack for it. You had to prepare for it. And especially the tombs of those in charge, of the ruling classes, could be filled with incredibly expensive and elaborate grave goods. We are looking at an object called the standard of Ur. A standard is a flag or a banner or a, an object carried on top of a pole into battle. Uh, you've seen this in movies from ancient Rome and uh, other ancient societies carrying the standard, um, usually with a crest or a, a, a verbiage of some sort. Um, this is actually not a standard. This is a hollow box that initially, when it was discovered in the 19th century, was thought to be a standard. But archaeologists have, have sort of changed their minds on what it is. What it is is we don't fully know. Some think that it might be a resonating box for an instrument, uh, allowing sound to travel, but we honestly don't know. But what we do know is that it was made using uh, very fine materials. It was made using uh, this blue stone called lapis lazuli, which came from Afghanistan. It, uh, this other sort of red stone, which came from India. And then there's shells here from uh, the Persian Gulf. So you, uh, that, that would be this inlay here. Um, so what you're, you're looking at is an incredibly expensive object that, that uh, required materials from a large geographical area to construct. So whoever um, this was made for, this king, was very important and very powerful. And you can tell by the quality of the materials used to make this object. Um, this was found in many, many, many fragments and was reconstructed um, over time. As you see, it is a, um, divided into three registers. Uh, you will probably notice at the top, the, the king is fairly obvious. He is in hieratic scale. He is taller than everybody else. In fact, he's so tall that he actually breaks the frame of the register uh, like a comic or something, uh, popping his head out. And so um, we also know that it's the most important scene because it's at the top. So making things larger and placing them at the top is often a sort of shorthand for power. Um, this, is, uh, this image is divided into two sides. We call this side the war side, and then in a minute we're going to be looking at the peace side. But this is actually probably part of one entire story, uh, a war and then the subsequent peace that follows. Um, if you look at the bottom register, you'll see images of chariots, 
being pulled by horses, and they are armed, um, and the soldiers riding in the chariots are armed with spears. If we look more closely, we can see the um, victory of battle. We can see the enemy being crushed beneath the, um, the feet of the horses here. Um, if we return to the second register, we can see a row of soldiers all armed and all in this sort of strict military uh, procession. And then if you look over here on the, on the right, you can see the vanquished enemy who has once again been stripped bare uh, as a sign of shame, as a sign of conquest, as a sign of having really sort of their, their power removed, stripped from them. And notice how they appear much more shambolic, much less structured in their positioning and the way they're moving compared to the regimented appearance of the soldiers. If we look at the top, um, we can see, um, once again, people who are of less importance, the smaller people compared to those who are larger than them. And in the center is the king holding a spear, holding a weapon, a symbol of his military might and power. If we look on the peace side, we can see the bounty provided by the king um, and his, uh, really his largesse. L-A-R-G-E-S-S-E -S -S -E is the word. It is um, uh, generosity. Uh, the, the gifts or the money bestowed by one person onto another. And so at the bottom we see something very similar that we saw in the work of Ace. We see images of people carrying uh, goods, um, grain, uh, also uh, animals, beasts of burden. Uh, if we look at the second register, we can also see uh, more of that kind of imagery of, of the sort of bounty that the king is willing to provide. At the top, we see very clearly the king because he is on the left. He is much larger than everybody else. Um, we see he is um, sort of dominates his attendants, but then he is sort of surrounded by these officials um, who uh, are basically raising a toast in sort of celebration uh, and in honor of their king. Uh, if you look at the right, you can see a musician playing a lyre, L-Y-R-E, uh, lyres were a, a very common instrument in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, they would have not been associated just with sort of music for pleasure, but also music as part of a religious ritual. So this is what we might be be witnessing. It's it's not 100% clear, but certainly this is meant to show the sort of two sides of rulership. We see the king here um, on the war side in dominance. Uh, with his power and his ability to rule and then over uh, and, and attain victory in battle. And then on the peace side, we see the sort of opposite of that, his ability to provide. And one kind of feeds in to the other. Um, we are here looking at another object found in a, um, in a tomb. This is called a bull-headed liar, um, which I have been accused of before. I'm joking. Um... <laughs> But uh, this is, once again, look, it's our bull. It's our horned animal, our symbol of power, our symbol of kingly power, our symbol of religious power. Um, let's take a look at another liar, though. Let's zoom in here. This um, comes from a city called Ur. Uh, we are looking at a, a, a bearded bull. So beards we have seen before, symbol of masculinity, symbols of... Uh, also wisdom. So this is a symbol of not just physical power, but intellectual power. Um, underneath the bull, we see an image, a uh, wooden image uh, inlaid with shell um, and some lapis lazuli. Uh, I'm sorry, just the shell in the, in the image uh, itself. Um, and we see an image of, of various animals. Um, we're not exactly sure what these mean. Um, some of these are meant to be maybe comical. Um, they're maybe um, meant to uh, sort of tell stories about kingly rule, um, but certainly um, they, they have a religious connotation. 
at the top you will see, you see a a figure of a king a man standing holding two bulls this is more than likely a reference to the epic of gilgamesh that sumerian epic i told you about um where one of the adventures of gilgamesh is he he kills this bull of heaven it actually ends up getting him in a lot of trouble uh, and he ended up he ends up losing his best friend ultimately because of it and he um, it causes uh, severe amounts of, of trouble for Gilgamesh but it is also a show of his power as a king um, we are also seeing something that we saw before in Chatal Hayuk where we saw the goddess figure sitting enthroned with the two lions on either side we're seeing something very similar in that heraldic figure uh, of the king standing in the middle and on either side holding these naturally powerful animals at bay. So once again, another symbol of power in that heraldic stance. Ancient Sumerians utilized something called cylinder seals. They were these stone or clay cylinders uh, with uh, inscribed um, carved lines and into the surface of the cylinder depicting stories. Uh, these could be religious stories, they could be stories of kings or queens, um, they related to various daily activities of Sumerian society, but everybody would have, or a lot of people would have worn one of these. Um, First, first of all, as you know, kind of a, a, a as a symbol of who they were, uh, but also these would have been used as a signature because if you roll one of these across a clay, uh, soft clay tablet, it makes an impression. So this would have been used as kind of a signature. Uh, businesses would have used these as a way of sort of putting their brand on things, or if you're shipping something, it tells you who it comes from. So these were more than just decorative, they were, they were functional. And we have thousands and thousands and thousands of these that uh, exist. Um, so uh, they tell us a lot about Sumerian society. In 2332 BC, the Sumerians were invaded by a neighboring people called the Akkadians. And so this is effectively the Indo-Sumerian society uh, as we know it.